Welcome, children of the basement. Tonight's panel is on Dracula. Count Dracula. Like that? <laughs> yeah. Here we go. <laughs> We are starting the very first Halloween slash horror slash supernatural slash scary stuff. Night scary episodes. Stuff. That's what we should have called it. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> Potentially scary stuff. So, I'm Mason. This is Uncle. I'm an idiot in a cape. <laughs> <laughs> That's Carter. And Tonight. Children, we are working on Dracula, which first debuted in Bram Stoker's novella of the same name in 1897. The second oldest character I believe we've done, second only to Thor, really, but, but that's not really fair. Yeah, yeah. He is not yeah. God. Yeah, <laughs> and of all like the classic novels, it's like one that feels the least like English homework. Like it's actually enjoyable to read. Had a grand old time. Get it on audio. It's great okay, on audio. And me, they call me Uncle. We're down here in the basement. Me and Carter and Mason. Surrounded by collectibles. And what we're going to do tonight is we have just watched Dracula. And we're going to walk you through some comic books, some art, some a game, and a variety of collectible things all related to Dracula. So, mm -hmm. I, I believed until tonight that the oldest movie I had seen all the way through was Dracula from mm -hmm. 1931. Now, when I was a kid, growing up in Wyoming, with Mason's dad, my brother, uh, we weren't allowed to stay up late at night, but once in a while on Friday night, our folks would go down to Ted's Bar, which is not called Ted's, not on the sign, it's called John's. Hostile takeover. Anyway, no, father-son deal. <laughs> so they'd go, to the, they'd go out and this girl named Connie would come over and she was our sitter. Well, Connie didn't mind if we stayed up and tried to watch Nightmare Theater. Yeah. The Nightmare Theater was my introduction to the Universal Monsters. They're called the Universal Monsters because Universal Studios produced all their movies. And they started back in 1931 with Dracula and then Frankenstein and there's a whole variety. And it's funny because I don't remember your dad trying to stay up, but I would try so hard to stay up and see these movies and I never made it. Aww. And so I later... In high school, college, I'd stay up late at night, I still do, and if an old movie came on, I'd watch it. And I thought that Dracula with Bela Lugosi was the movie that inspired me to read the Bram Stoker novel. After watching it tonight, it was not, because oh. I remember very specific <laughs> scenes and that was not the movie I remembered. So now I have to find that movie yeah. because this kind of thing makes me crazy. Yeah. And we're actually going to do panels and talk about some of these hunts I've gone on for images uh, that I remember seeing when I was very young. And the only image from tonight's movie was of the castle and the interior of the castle. That was all very memorable. But we'll get to that in a minute. So we want to talk about comic books and magazines first. So I set out to find adaptations of Bram Stoker's novel and I found several. And just like with the movies, there's been a ton of adaptations of that novel. Oh yeah. It's because it's public domain. Yes. Public domain is your friend. So, I, one of the places I checked, and we've mentioned this magazine before, is Dracula Lives. Now, Dracula Lives uh, was published by Marvel and distributed by Curtis Magazines. And in this particular, this is uh, issue number five from March 1974. 
The cover is by Luis Dominguez. And inside, there are multiple stories and articles about Dracula. But in this issue, Roy Thomas as the writer and Dick Gior Giordano. Giordano started with chapter one of an adaptation of Dracula. Now, they continued the adaptation in uh, Dracula Lives Number 6 from May 1974. Uh, the cover again was by Luis Domingo. Dominguez. Dominguez, sorry. <laughs> Carter. Mm -hmm. uh, then it continued on. Pull that one. In number 7 from July 1974, same cover artist. Then we go to number 8. September 1974, same cover artist, and in each one of these is another chapter of Dracula, and they continued this chapter by chapter. This is number 10 from January 1975. For some reason, they skipped number 9, but we get number 10. Then they get to number 11 from March 1975. This cover is actually by Steve Fabian. Um, and I really like these covers. I, I think the cover art's really good. Uh, now, the problem was, number 11, they ended that series. The magazine series was canceled. And so they are like, they were looking for some place to continue this story. And Legion of Monsters was coming out. It came out in September 1975. And so they did the next chapter in that magazine, and it has a cover by Neil Adams. Ooh. This seemed like a sure thing to be a series. They did one issue and canceled this magazine. So this was in 1975, okay? Well, they hadn't finished the story. They hadn't finished the novel. And then... I should have looked this up, but in 2004 or 2005, so... 15 years ago? Well, no, how many years from 75 to 2005? 30, 40? Yeah. 30. So all those years later, the same two guys, Roy Not Thomas and Dick... G Dick Giordano. Giordano did this limited series. Now... What they did is they took the chapters they'd already completed and repeated them in these first two issues, and then they wrapped the story up in these last two issues. And so this limited series of four finished the story, and they had finished their adaptation. Are they all black and white and red inside? They're all black and white. There's no color. Oh. It would have been cool if they did black was. and white and red. Like that would be cool. Like kind of like Sin cool. City. Yeah. And and the art bit. the oh, art style sweet. in them is really is really well done and really fits. Um, what's interesting is for Marvel, Gene Colan is kind of the artist known for Dracula, and. It, we're going to do additional uh, Dracula movies, additional Dracula panels, and so we're going to touch on quite a few different artists that have done Dracula. But this was a, a really faithful adaptation of the source material. So continuing our discussion about Dracula, uh, one of the things I wanted to go over was art. And my favorite, and you'll hear this, repeatedly, one of my favorite artists is Frank Frazetta. And in 1966, Frank Frazetta blessed us with the cover of Creepy Number 5. This is a painting of Dracula. Um, I also got a print of it that Carter's hanging on to and hiding behind. For dear life! And I have always really liked, this is a Dracula to be feared. When you look at this Dracula, if you were to see him coming towards you, it would be terrifying. Immediate pants. <laughs> yeah. 
and trying out those there's no, <laughs> There's none of that ghoul school crap here. As soon as you look at it, it tells you a story. There's always details that you don't notice at a glance. This one is full of little details that there's some kind of ghostly faces, there's bats, there's, there's little hints at things, there's, there's headstone. Every time I look at it, I see something new or different, and it always tells me a story, but what it really captures is how terrifying Dracula could be. He makes an impression. Definitely with his paintings. Yes. I believe he painted it for Creepy, which was published by Warren at the time in 1966. That was actually the first uh, piece of art that I even thought about when we were putting this together. Now the other poster I have here, in one of the books I have of Frazetta's, it says this is called Dracula and Frankenstein. What's odd is this is just Dracula holding the victim and when you see the full painting it extends out horizontally and Frankenstein's over here and I've also seen it labeled as Creatures of the Night. It's a completely different look for Dracula than the one from Creepy but I find both of them fascinating where Dracula is a character I've, I've been interested in and seen multiple movies and things like that. This was my first pick for art um, for Dracula. Having said that, Mason did an original drawing and he's going to show us. We, Carter and I, have not seen it. No. So this is the see right world now? reveal. The reveal for us. So we want to see it. I gotta go get it. <laughs> so I did these last night until about four o'clock in the morning. I, I, well, first I wanted to say, I drew this, this is the third time I drew it. I sketched it once in my sketchbook, and I sketched it again in my sketchbook, and then I kind of knew the concept that I wanted to do, but I wanted to say that this is just my conceptual take of Dracula as a character. So, yeah. World exclusive. Right here. We're seeing it live. I made three of them. Well, it's not live, but it's live for us. There you go. Alright. Show them first before it shows up. Show it up. Yeah. Whatever you want to do. Awesome. Yeah. And if you could show it front ways. Well, the cool part is invertible. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so yeah, that is cool. I designed this, Ace. like I said, as a concept design. <laughs> so you see that the character Dracula is in front. I I made it. I just wanted to make it simple and not really super complex with movement. Or, if I were to do it again, I would have him like ex like extending his hand with either like his gaze down or, or up or something like that and then I would probably have a scene with maybe his his uh, his three mistresses Aram. and maybe uh, what's it called like his prey or something but then I kind of just made, so made my own castle and kind of had bats flying through that's about the only uh, movement but then I also put like the moon in the background to kind of mirror his head. It's the same size as his head, so it kind of, I don't know. And then I put trees on the side. I thought that was kind of cool. But um, I had these printed off today. I stayed up pretty late doing this, but they turned out pretty cool. This is so um, sick. This is awesome. But also- um, I'm keeping this. Yeah. Yes. Well, that's why I made it for you. So. Well, good, because I'm keeping this. <laughs> but anyway, I'm a tattoo artist, so I kind of made this as a tattoo design. Oh, leg it later. So, like, if you did it on your arm, you can see it both ways. Or, I don't know. But anyway. Yeah, come to Wyoming. He will tattoo this on your body. But yeah, it was just a fun thing to do. We were doing Dracula. I thought it'd be cool to, to draw Dracula. But, like, my own character, um... Main characteristics of Dracula, I think, are 
Um, his widow's peak, of course. Very some, important. Some arching, bat-like eyebrows. Um, and then I think they always kind of portray Dracula as like mysterious but alluring in a way. Yeah. Bright eyes and then drip, like cloaked in black. So just the basics and then I got his creepy version upside down. Yeah. Uh, I noticed that. Yeah. Very nice. But yeah. So cool. And, and a lot of times too we talk we're talking about things that have inspired us in some way and uh one of the things is seeing the Dracula movies inspired me to read the books and also collect and read the comics. And so this panel, we got it to inspire Mason to create original art. And that's cool. I need to do more. But Oh, I got lots. You all in time, you know? Now, one of the other things, in addition to art and comics, we talk about collectibles. And sometimes those will be models or action figures or statues or busts, things like that. But uh, when I started looking at Dracula, uh, this is a novel. It's called The Dracula Tape by Fred Saberhagen. It was copyrighted in 1975. And Fred Saberhagen is a sci-fi uh, author. He does the Berserker Saga and I've read a few of his books but I really like this one because he takes the Dracula Bram Stoker's novel and he flips the script and it's told from Dracula's perspective and it's told with Dracula as a good guy. Yeah, and a great guy almost. <laughs> yeah, he is. They explain every event in the novel yeah. From a different perspective, with Dracula doing something heroic or something. Yeah. So like I, all of those horrible things that <laughs> happened in Bram Stoker's, those were either misunderstandings or the fault of the victims. So it's kind of like Maleficent with it's, Sleeping Beauty. Well, Indeed. You, didn't you say earlier Stan Helsing? Or no, what's the one? Uh, Tucker and Dale versus Tucker Evil. Tucker and Dale versus Evil. Oh, like, that's how he explains <laughs> all those people dying on the boat. Like, these kids just started killing themselves. <laughs> so there's always a hint that he might be lying on some of them. And that's what I, I really enjoyed about that book while skimming it in preparation for this panel. Well, and, and this book is actually the first of a series where Dracula is like this positive force and he helps out like... Uh, Sherlock Holmes in the next yeah, one. Yeah, counter Sherlock Holmes, uh, Mina Murray. Mina Murray and Murray, later Mina Harker. Murray's in him, she Harker. marries John. Yeah, and so it's really, it, it's really an interesting book. I really enjoyed it. Loaned it to Carter, he blitzed right through it. Oh yeah, it was awesome. So, one of the other things we want to talk about is games. Usually we talk about video games, sometimes we're going to talk about hero clicks. Where have these characters showed up? Dracula has shown up in a lot of games, but one I wanted to tell you about today, when I moved to Utah in 1990, I worked I worked in software, so it was mostly guys, mostly single guys, mostly nerdy guys. Well, I rounded up all the single guys that had no wives or kids, like me at the time, and we would play cards. But once a week, we had a card game. And then when the card players started dropping off, we played Dungeons and & Dragons, and we tried board games. But one of the board games we played was The Fury of Dracula. And this game, um, what I really liked, so it has a map of Europe, and the, the person controlling the game has a, a screen, and he is Dracula, he or she, and he moves around on a board that the other players can't see, and the other players hunt Dracula. And so it had little action figures. Sweet. Put them in a sandwich bag so they don't get lost. It's own combat system. It had miniatures, which is always fun. It had character cards. I mean, it was a really kind of a deep game. One of the, and it followed the novel. Dracula has the same powers he has in the novel. 
and he has the same weaknesses. Each interpretation handles strengths and weaknesses a little different. His strengths, if you were looking at him like a superhero, he had the strength of 20 men and he could uh, control the weather, which they don't use a whole lot. He could turn into mist. He could turn into a bat or a wolf, which a lot of them use. He could scale walls like a lizard. Yeah. Uh, he could do hypnosis. He could. He was telepathic. He was very, very powerful. And so uh, that's what the novel really builds up is how powerful and dangerous he is. Now his weakness, uh, everybody thinks that if he goes out in the sun, not everybody, but in a lot of movies, if he gets hit by sunlight, he turns to dust. Ash. Well, or ash, that, that <laughs> better word. He doesn't. It just takes away his powers, but he can walk around in the sunlight. And some of the movies handle that, some don't. Yeah, it really depends on if the plot requires it or not. There's something in there about he can only cross running water on high and low tides, but there are times he cannot cross running water. And uh, the Saberhagen books also mention that. Uh, but one of the, I always felt That's like cool. one of the biggest deals of weakness, and Saberhagen focuses on it in the books, is he cannot enter a, a living quarters or a home without being invited. And that is really everybody's defense against Dracula. You know, you hear about garlic. That's really nice. Stranger danger. Yeah. That's a really he, good thing. He cannot come in the house unless you invite him. Now, when Saberhagen's <laughs> writing him... Don't you wish perverts were like yeah. that? <laughs> <laughs> no, I don't yeah. sure. And so, uh, you know, and, and everybody knows, you know, the weakness uh, is that the sunlight takes away his powers or kills him. Uh, one of the other kind of odd ones in my mind is when he's in his coffin mm -hmm. if you put a rose on it he can't open it or it traps him in the coffin rose or, or like a wafer from communion yeah yeah any kind of it's religious like sim hammer symbol on his, hurt. yeah uh, on we were we were laughing about these weaknesses because i cannot uh digest garlic <laughs> yeah. It makes me sicker than a dog, and so garlic is uncle's weakness. Is my weakness. I cannot. And that's handle what he shares garlic. in common with Dracula. <laughs> and I hate the sun. <laughs> <laughs> and Carter, Carter does not go out in the sun a lot. I got sunburned buried under two feet of sand. <laughs> that's how much I hate the sun. And I just dress in black a lot. And stays yeah. up all night. That's what we and have I, in common with Dracula. Oh, <laughs> so, uh, so like, like I said, one of the things we did tonight was we watched Dracula, the 1931 movie with Bela Lugosi it's from Universal Universal Studios. Um, again, I thought I'd seen it. I thought it was the oldest movie I've seen. Now it is. And now it is. But it was not. Frankenstein, I've always thought Frankenstein was, until I looked up the release dates, Frankenstein and Dracula movies were released in the same year, but Frankenstein was later in the year. So tonight we watched Dracula from 1931 from Universal Studios, or Universal Pictures, I think they were called back then. Yeah, yeah. And probably. And we used our scoring system. And so we're each going to give you our review, and then at the end we'll pop up the scoreboard showing our scores and where these land on our scoreboards. Um, for me, I enjoyed the beginning of the movie because I did remember the imagery of the castle and the trip to the castle, and then that first time you see Dracula down in the dungeon yeah, and the Three Brides... Cool. Th that setting and the atmosphere they created, yeah, I great thought was start. really good. Had a really good start. The the people on the coach on their way to the town, that was kind of silly, and the acting wasn't great. And but the movie went along pretty well. It was nostalgic, you know, remembering yeah. the book. But then I started noticing the things they cut out. Uh, Dracula crawling down the side of the castle. The, 
the baby being dropped in the courtyard, the the danger of the brides. Um, and so for me, it, it just kind of run along into three from then on. Now, once they got over to London, um, what I remember from the book was, uh, it was a lot about Lucy and Lucy's being turned into a vampire. That's where you kind of really learn the vampire process is Lucy. And in the end, they have to stake Lucy and it was a really traumatic experience. Well, they pretty much touched on that and then pretty much left the source material behind. Oh, yeah. And then, um, then it becomes a focus on Mina. And by now, Van Helsing's involved and he's kind of, he's the one who knows an awful lot about really weird things. Yeah. And uh, the actor playing him, he was okay. But I felt like the one who was stealing every scene was Renfield. Yeah. He was playing this maniacal character that was really funny and really creepy. And like Carter said in that one scene, or one of you said, I think he crawled up and ate that lady. <laughs> he did. He totally crawled up and ate some orderly at the hospital. But, and no one mentioned it ever again. Yeah. She he, just disappeared. He must have eaten all of her. <laughs> like, no evidence. And the movie itself has a very much a feel of a play, of, of a play production. A lot of things happen off screen. Uh, you never see any transformations because they didn't have the special effects for it. Their special effects were bats on wires. Which was awesome. Which was kind of <laughs> yeah. cool. But that was about it. Jonathan versus bats. Here, it was Jonathan. awesome. <laughs> and, uh, and I was actually surprised when the movie ended because instead of the, the hunt, which I really enjoy in the book, and the chase into Transylvania and the urgency, they just find Dracula down in uh, Carfax, Carfax Abbey and, and kill him off screen. And so yeah. I get that back then do they? you couldn't do that kind of stuff. At no time do you ever see fangs. At no time does anyone ever even get close to being bit. There's no blood. There's no blood. And it it is in black and white, but so overall for me, uh, I, I saw it and uh, I I enjoyed it. But again, it's a movie I would only watch once, and so that's kind of where I ended up with it. Mason. Okay. Um, <clears throat> I was drawing a lot while we were watching this movie. I tend to draw. When I'm watching movies, um, I listen, I peer up a lot. Um, the beginning of the movie was awesome. Um, imagery was cool, and you can tell where, you know, classic horror got its start. And um, a lot of cool imagery of the castle and the mountains and the carriage and the horses and the, the mustaches and, and, <laughs> and the lady, like, just... Straight up, like, hall oh, Dracula, <laughs> holy. Oh, don't go up there. <laughs> yeah. But, um, so, I, I really enjoyed those parts, and um, that was the first time I heard the line, um, uh, Children, children, of, the children of the night. <laughs> what what music they make. Or, like, yeah. Children of the night. What music they make. So, and that was really cool because um, there's this motionless and white song that has that at the beginning. I think it's called Creatures, and it's really good. Awesome. Um, and I've never seen that. I thought it was really cool. But yeah, the whole thing seemed like a play mm -hmm. to me, um, which I thought was good. And like, I'm trying to picture it as me being back in that time. But at the same time, all the movies that we've seen in our generation and stuff, like you were talking about in the game, you played that in the 90s. We weren't even born yet. <laughs> and um, yeah. so we've kind of been desensitized to things. So that whole, like, it kind of fades to black and they have you decide, your imagination decide what happens. Sometimes they cut it really quick. 
so they barely said they had two holes in her neck and then it went to the next scene and um which i thought was cool because it's classic horror and it makes your imagination visualize it um but at the same time uh my bag of cats it's hard to hold my attention and if you haven't seen the other review of our you know our wonder woman 84 to show you how we review we review by five stars every five minutes and mine landed on a lot of threes and it was a lot shorter movie than most so do i tell my score i will at the end okay so but all in all uh i thought it was cool to see dracula and um yeah that scene in the basement was really like whoa like i bet you people back then were like what the like well, just when, like holy sh- well and the hand coming out of the coffin and uh, yeah yeah it was really oh and i like the model boat but you could tell when it <laughs> splashed that the drops were huge <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. but i thought it was awesome and those bats were the bats the bats were great. they were fake but you loved them yep yeah. i love the bats <laughs> Because <laughs> their hero is just, just Jonathan Harker versus Giant Bat. Ah. And he's like this little English dandy, just like, eh, I'll show you what for. <laughs> yeah. All so, right. Thumbs All up right. for me. All right. Carter? All right. My take on it. I, like Morgan, I am very certain I saw it myself at one point long ago, but completely forgot it, so it might as well have been brand new for me. It was great. And like my colleagues here, I believe the strongest part was was the beginning, because the parts that got fours and threes for me were, like, really well done technical parts, like... You saw the backdrop of the castle, and you knew it was fake, of course, but it was so well done that you didn't mind. Oh, no. Not at all. Put you right there. <laughs> and I also agree that Renfield, of all people, kind of stole the show, because he's a, he's a creepy, creepy little son. <laughs> yeah, yeah he, I, I think he kind of stole the show. I thought Lugosi was great, and he's so oh, iconic, yeah. but Renfield was... You could put him in a movie now, playing that that way, and it would come across scary as hell. Oh, yeah. So, I thought that was cool. Like, Nutter Butter's there. And I noticed that you rather insightfully pointed out it was like a stage play. And, allegedly. <laughs> allegedly. Allegedly. <laughs> no, that's to be fair. To be fair. No. <laughs> anyway. Okay. While trying to get the rights for Dracula from Bram Stoker's family, they couldn't really do that. In fact, they even had Bela Lugosi as their intermediary. Like, that was his job, was to try to talk down uh, Mrs. Stoker's price on the rights. So what they did is, instead of buying the rights to the book, they allegedly bought the rights to the much cheaper stage show. Oh. And funnily enough... Yeah, I love it. <laughs> <laughs> they bought the rights to the stage show. Yeah, yeah, thank you, thanks. And funnily enough, that Bra- that uh, Bela Lugosi, Van Helsing, and it, I think one or two of the other people were from, like, the 200-plus performance stage show. Like, they were cast based on that. Mm-hmm. Nice. Huh. Cool. Well, that's that's a good segue because uh, one thing, let me quickly, we're going to put up our scoreboard. So the way we scored it, I gave it a 3.067. It had one four-star moment in the second uh, five minutes, in in the ten-minute mark. Uh, Just the atmosphere and and the castle and all that. Uh, Mason gave it a... 2.800. 2.800. And uh, Carter gave it a 3.6. And so those are our scores. Those the positions they ended up. Now since we've only seen two movies, or we've only scored two movies, 
um, Dracula and Wonder Woman are in our top ten. So I can almost guarantee you that by the fourth movie we review, Wonder Woman will be off the board. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Wonder Woman 84. Wonder Woman 1984, yes. We Good still see. have respect for the first one that Mason hasn't seen, seen but we will. <laughs> so, casting. This is the first Dracula movie we watched, so this is a cast any. We can cast anybody we want, just like you can. Uh, we don't care who, what, who could play Dracula. So, when I sat down to figure out who I would cast, one, I wanted him to be European. And so I start thinking through the European actors. Then I start looking at the... I, I like to go look up comic book images or paintings when possible. And so I was looking at this painting of Dracula, which is substantially different than the other one on the cover of Creepy. And looking at this painting, I was inspired to cast Mads Mikkelsen. Again, mm. this is the second time I've cast him. But I can totally see him playing Dracula. And he has both the charm and charisma to, to pull that off. And he also has the menace and the threat to pull it off. Mm. He's played both good guys and bad guys. I almost cast him too. <clears throat> Yeah, you and I get on the same wavelength a couple times, but... We're going to have that's to... That's my cast. We'll come to blows over that eventually. <laughs> It'll okay. happen. So which one of you wants to go next? Ah, you gotta have stakes on your Rochambeau. <laughs> okay. My take requires some explanation. Keanu Reeves. Not just any Keanu Reeves, current Keanu Reeves, because it's important to note that he was in the 1992 version of Dracula and <laughs> sucked out loud. He even admits that himself. Like, it was so bad I almost put on the alternate language commentary, the alternate language track just because I thought it'd be better. Like, I almost watched it in Spanish. But I think now that Keanu Reeves has matured as an actor and as a person, I think he could really pull that off, like all those traits you were complimenting Mads Mikkelsen over. Like, he could be suave and also tear your throat out in the middle of the night. And, like, in the John Wick movies, toward the end of each one, when he's all bloody and his hair is long and in his face, like, just add some fangs. In fact, there's, there's a legitimate <laughs> internet rumor that he's a friggin' vampire already, so cast him. Nice. Good call. There's your Dracula. All right, Mason. <clears throat> the wild card. The bag of cats <laughs> speaks. Open the bag. <laughs> Release the kitties. You haven't cast anybody, have you? No, I've cast two people. Okay. And they're both musicians. Hmm. Okay. Because I... I want a Dracula who's a musician. Because I feel like most musicians are kind of uh, vampires. A little vampire. I don't know why. Makes that, sense. That, that, that just, that, yeah. So, do I say both of them? You can't. Sure. Or I'm just. Shoot. It's anything goes. It's, it's Thunderdome. Just throw it. I think, I think Dave Navarro would be my Dracula. <laughs> yeah. You know him from Ink Masters. From nowadays, well, that's and then not what I know him from. <laughs> back in the day, you know him from Jane's Addiction. Yes. But he kind of already dresses like Dracula. So, but I think, I don't know. He's got that look that makes you be like, are you going to kill me or <laughs> what's, what's, what's going on? <laughs> like, it's, it's like, what? <laughs> yeah, so, um, but I think he would be good or... No, I'm not even going to say it. No, say it. I think if I guess who I think it is, will you say it? Yeah. Davey Havoc from AFI? No, damn, that would be good too. There's three people I would <laughs> pick. <laughs> the cats are No, those. I want Davey Havoc. I want <laughs> <laughs> It'd be, uh, I think it's Villa Vallo from him. The lead singer Ooh. of him. Oh, 
I know what you're talking about now that you said because him. He's from Finland. He's oh. got a really deep voice, but mm. is like very slender and could definitely pull off a Dracula. So, um, I don't know. I'm kind of in that realm. Musicians as Dracula. or But anyway, bag of cats, out. <laughs> yeah, all over the place. Nice. Rats be warned. We'll show more on Drac. There's there's so much to cover on Dracula. We'll be showing more. You bet. We're gonna do the movie that uh, Carter was just talking about with Keanu Reeves is on the list. So when we get down into the '90s, we'll be seeing that. But uh, there's a lot of Universal did a number of Dracula movies and some crossover movies, and we're gonna see some of those. And then we're going to go into the Hammer House of Horrors. Yeah, I look forward and to that one. I, yeah, we're real. We're, I think Carter and I especially, and, and Mason I don't think is familiar with them, but it's going to be really fun to compare and contrast the Hammer Dracula, which is Christopher Lee, one of our favorites, with the Universal Studios, who actually use several different actors over the years. And so look forward to those as we go down through our Halloween-themed playlist. Uncle Al. <laughs> Cat Al. Nice. Carter Al. Yeah. <clears throat> Tell us who you think would be uh, good as Dracula. If, do you, if you liked our picks, cool. Um, do you think my rendition of uh, Dracula is kind of close? anything i don't know it's awesome um if you like this video like and subscribe if not that's okay too we'll be back again um thanks for staying up with us and i was also gonna say like uncle used to stay up for um what's it called nightmare theater nightmare theater if you're a kid from the 90s possibly we did the same thing with toonami word so i can kind of relate to uncle's nightmare theater but I always fell asleep or my parents came in and told me to go to bed and stop watching. Always during watching. Dragon Ball. <laughs> well, I'd always make it to like Trigun or um, Cowboy Bebop, something like that. But nice. anyway, have a good night or a good day. Um, we'll see you guys later. <laughs> <laughs>